Hello, leaders of the world. Welcome to Spread Love and Organizations, a podcast for purpose-driven healthcare leaders striving to make life better around the world by leading their teams with genuine care, servant leadership, and love. I'm Najee, your host today, joined by Dr. Jason Gluck, Director of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Program at Harvard Healthcare Hospital. Jason is a physician, founder of the Extracorporeal Membrane Oxygenation Program, and creator of the first and only mobile ECMO program in Connecticut, bringing the life-saving technology to patients in need throughout New England and the US. He invented VDAD, a medical simulator for training patients, families, pre-hospital emergency medical care and hospital-based providers about patients supported by mechanical pumps. Dr. Gluck publishes and speaks internationally on mechanical support and acute cardiogenic shock. He has a passion for jazz and enjoys hiking, biking, and skiing, and so many different things I can I can talk about uh, of Jason, but I'm so happy to have him with me today. Jason, great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Najee. It's a pleasure to be here. As I shared in the intro, you're you're an inventor, you're a physician, you're a student even these days, but actually every single day you are saving saving patients' lives. You're, we say, not even at the heart, you're literally saving them uh, in, your, in your daily practice. Uh, I'm interested to, uh, to know, and all of us uh, listening to you today, what, what is your personal story? What got you to be the physician and the lifesaver every single day today? So it's a bit of a long story. So you, it's a short question and a long answer. So here it goes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I, um, I actually started wanting absolutely nothing to do with medicine. So I, um, I initially uh, went to college. My mother's a math teacher. My father a science teacher and was sure I was going to be a lawyer or a philosopher or anything far away from the sciences. So I didn't sign up for any math or science classes my freshman year of college. And uh, I remember going home from, from school after the introduction and telling my parents what I signed up for. And, my father being so mad, he's yelling, what if you want to be a doctor? No math, no science, like so loud. Other <laughs> people are pulling off the road like somebody's going crazy. And I look him square, square in the eyes and say, pops, no way I'm never going to be a doctor. I'm never going to be a doc. Um, and so uh, that's how it started. And then I get to college and there's an ambulance and I kind of want to drive with lights and sirens. I didn't really care all that much about the medical stuff, but the lights and sirens sounded like fun. So in order to be a ambulance driver, you had to become an EMT. And so I became an EMT uh, to drive with lights and sirens that I did get to do. And, but I also <laughs> fell in love with the medicine part. And so I started teaching with the American Heart Association and kind of learning about EMS and EMTs is very good, but it's pretty basic. So then I went on to become a paramedic. And as a paramedic, I was starting to get a little bit more advanced into the medications and what we did, but um, I wasn't so good at listening to other people and paramedics have to listen. And so uh, I talked to some of my friends and said, what, what am I going to do next? And they said, I was thinking about maybe becoming a nurse. And they said, Jason, you won't be a good nurse. You don't, you don't listen. Uh, and then I said, okay, maybe I'll be a, 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 a PRN or a PA. And they said, Jason, you're not listening. You're, you're not going to be a good follower. You need to be a leader. Otherwise it's not going to work for you. And so um, I had to go back to my father that summer and say, hey, pops, I have to go to summer school because I had to make up the math and science I didn't take my freshman year. And uh, forever does he tell me, I told you so. So I went on to take my summer courses and I, and I um, became a, uh, a, a biology major in college as, as I worked for him as a pool man, because that was what he did. I was a pool guy. He was a pool guy. So I did summer school and worked on pools and then um, decided when I was back in New York that I was going to also do EMS in New York because I liked it so much. So that brought me to the fire service because in New York, you have to be a, 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 in order to be a medic, you have to be a fireman. So I became a firefighter. I worked on a hook and ladder for a long time and fell in love with firefighting. So <laughs> spent wow. my college and uh, years as a firefighter and a paramedic. Um, then I got to take a year off to make money and spend it uh, as a firefighter and a medic in, in New York City area. And I lived in Long Island as a volunteer on Long Island and worked for, um, as a medic uh, for a career and then got into medical school and did four years of medical school in New York and then 
my residency and my fellowship and my sub fellowship in uh, cardiology and advanced heart failure and transplant where I developed a passion for cardiogenic shock and for this heart and lung machine called ECMO. Then uh, transplanted myself, if you will, from New York to Connecticut. And I've been here for the last uh, now 11 years where I've been running the program here. So it's been a, a bit of a story. So you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a, what a great story. And you said many times, I told you, you don't listen. I, I'm, I'm sure you do, right? Like you're, you're a leader. You're actually working on one of the most stressful uh, it would be great if you explain a little bit uh, what is ECMO, what you do briefly, but you're, you're in the most stressful situations of life and death for patients within seconds. So I'm sure you listen. You lead and you listen. So yeah, if you can just say a little bit ECMO and then tell us a little bit how you, how, how you listen today as, as a leader and lead at the same time. Sure. So when I, when I came to Connecticut, uh, ECMO really wasn't here. Um, and my first exposure to ECMO was a, a young mom. She just had a baby and she had a very serious heart condition called peripartum myopathy after having the baby. And she was dying and her baby was just alive, the happiest moment of her life. And she was dying. And so we brought in this machine in training and it really saved her life. Got her on this machine after a week or so, her heart recovered enough to be back on her own. And she was able to um, follow up with her baby and, and live with her baby and she's still alive today. So it's a great story. Wow. And so I kind of learned the power of this technology and what, what it is, is really, it's a fancy heart and lung machine. That's extremely simplistic. And it's a nice way to incorporate my firefighting and my pool business into <laughs> practice um, because you essentially use a swimming pool pump or a firefighting pump and you put it through a, mem through a membrane, you take the blood out of the body, you suck it through this pump, it's kind of like in a, in a hot tub. When you put your hand in front of the jet, you can feel that continuous flow of water. It's that kind of a pump that continually flows blood from outside the body through this membrane, which is like a fish lung that adds oxygen, moves carbon dioxide. It's kind of like dialysis for the lung and then sends the blood back to the body. And so if your lung's not working or your heart's not working, this machine, this ECMO machine can take over for the function of that either temporarily uh, for recovery or as a bridge to something like a heart transplant, a lung transplant or something like this. And so I brought this into Connecticut, uh, into Hartford Healthcare, and um, we developed a program now almost eight years ago. And at first it was a bit of a challenge to get it off the ground because change is hard, especially in medicine. And then uh, eventually we developed this mobile program where I got to incorporate my paramedics and my firefighting into uh, into the medical world. So I kind of traded my fire truck for a helicopter. Um, so uh, now instead of lights and sirens, you get the whir of the helicopter blades overhead. So we um, at Hartford Healthcare, we're fortunate to have an air medical service and we've partnered with them. So if somebody needs this life-saving technology outside of the hospital, um, where it's not offered, we can bring it to them. So if you look at the demographics in the United States, there's about 30,000 hospitals in the United States of which only about 400 or so offer this ECMO technology. And wow. so if you happen to end up at the hospital that doesn't have it uh, and you're dying and you need it, then um, the only way to get it is for someone to bring it to you. And so we've set up this program where we can actually take our equipment, our staff to another hospital, uh, initiate life-saving support for that patient at the other hospital, uh, and then bring them back to our center for definitive care. And so we've done that now about uh, 180 times or so. And we're uh, fortunately really one of the, the leaders in how to do this. Um, and COVID, uh, lung machines and COVID are a very real need. And so yeah. uh, it's been very busy for me over the last year or so. I've had to defer my schooling for a year in part because of it. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of calls for young people, otherwise healthy, that are suffering with this catastrophic viral illness and sometimes need these machines. And so we're using it uh, quite a bit around the world. And so it's been a, a nice opportunity to collaborate and kind of leverage the benefits of, of, of everything. And I call it leveraging your competition, where I'm able to take each individual hospital and we work as a team, because there's only so many of these machines and so many of these beds. So you can't, you can't overfill and it becomes not competitive. It becomes about the patient. And so now we have this organization we call up the Northeast ECMO Consortium where pretty much anybody in the Northeast 
who belongs, we get a call for if we don't have a bed because we're full or if the other hospitals don't have a bed because they're full, we'll share our, our collective beds for ECMO and we can then get ECMO to people wherever they are. And so it feeds wow. into my philosophy of ECMO for anybody, anywhere, anytime. I'd love to double click on this because I know you've worked a lot and you're building somehow the idea of how you can take this initiative and make it even stronger and broader for patients who need it across uh, across the geographies. Um, how, you know, what, what's, what's your learning building it? It came out of necessity with COVID uh, and now it, it becomes for you something like a need that you're you're seeing even beyond COVID. Like, why would a patient can benefit from this all over the geography? So, so what what are you working on this? And uh, you know, what what are the next steps for you to be able to deliver on it? Yeah. So it comes back to listening, right? So the the place it started was we before COVID even existed, we had a network of people trying to get patients to us that couldn't otherwise. And so instead of just letting them linger at the outside center, we decided to come up with a program where we'll help not only patients, but also providers that found themselves in need. And so that's where this started. And then when COVID hit, we'd all already kind of laid the groundwork for, let's talk about making this a network because this was a big need. And COVID really helped us break the barriers of institution and, and the barriers of competition by opening the floodgates and saying, listen, forget competition, let's help people. And that was a beautiful thing. And so as much as COVID sucks, and I absolutely hate COVID, um, it really did uh, allow us to accelerate the plans to build this um, competitive network without competition. Um, and yeah. it's, been, it's been a beautiful, like I said, it's been beautiful. I remember the, one of the first COVID patients that I actually took care of um, as, a, as a savior, he was at another hospital that wasn't my hospital. He needed this lung machine and I had no bed. And so I ended up going to this hospital that called for us and through this network, took the patient to a hospital in Boston. So I went from Connecticut to Boston with the patient because I had no beds. And it, wow. the patient recovered in, in Boston and then came back to us and recovered and is now home. And um, so the, the power of this network is to really like I said before, leverage competition to make sure that patients benefit. And by doing that, everybody benefits. Our system benefits, the patient benefits, the, the whole medical care system learns. Now, they, all these patients are in a study. We collaborate together to build the knowledge base around how to treat COVID. So it's been a really um, uh, nice uh, way to see this work out. Yeah, no, that's... That, that's an impressive and it's great to see, you know, this, it always bring me hope how uh, different stakeholders in healthcare get together uh, with, with COVID. Uh, hopefully we will remain working together, right? As different stakeholders, even, uh, even moving forward. Um, Jason, you, you talked about change is hard, right? And so I, I wanna go back to this because Again, you're saving patients uh, with, with what you've been doing, right? A patient at a time, and it's concrete. The example you, you gave are people now back home living with their families, thanks to your work. How, how did you manage this? The change is hard, especially when it's, uh, you know, something that is life-saving. And what did you do, in fact, for, for your teams to embrace this change and become now um, those healthcare providers who are saving even beyond the, the institution you work for? Yeah, so ECMO had a bad rap. So when ECMO first started, many people called it DEFMO um, because oh. it was really a very difficult technology to use in the beginning. It, it's, it's actually roots are about 30 to 50 years old. And when it was first rolled out, it was so complicated. And the, and the technology was really um, lacking, for lack of a better word, that anyone who went on really didn't survive. And so it's actually the pediatricians that kept it alive for some time in, in kids. And then only over the last 15 years or so have we really started to be able to adapt this technology to adults. And for many of the hospitals, many of the hospitals and many of the medical systems, it tends to be very aristocratic where there's, you know, the senior doc that passes information to the junior docs and all. That. So the senior docs all remember DEFMO. They all remember the challenges that ECMO brought. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
when this young whippersnapper from New York comes in with an, a chip on his shoulder and doesn't like to listen to anybody, um, you know, has an idea that he wants to do, all of a sudden, who's this crazy guy? You know, I, uh, I actually kept some of the emails about um, when I first proposed this. Some of the senior physicians in the leadership really wrote strong emails and letters opposed to what this crazy Dr. Gluck was trying to do. And now actually one just retired last year. I showed, I presented him the email. He was actually one of my biggest referrers because <laughs> uh, he got convinced on, on how this technology can be helpful. It's just different. And we've learned a lot over the last 30 years. And frankly, we have a lot more to learn. And so with this technology, we're now changing the way that critical care is, is practiced. I mean, you know, there in, for example, in COVID, you know, it's, it's been very tough. Survival for patients on ECMO is only 25% in my hands, which is okay. Um, but, you know, that means for every one patient saved, three aren't. Um, and that's, the, that's a hard reality. Um, and so it's death mo again. And now we have to make sure that people are aware that we're learning, we're growing. And it's not just one patient at a time. It's the whole system. And yeah. so overcoming those kind of barriers requires what I tell my seven-year-old and five-year-old and three-year-old patience and persistence. And you have to just be calm, cool, and collected. And you have to um, uh, counteract opinion with fact and um, really show off what you're doing and show data that's, that it's working and have quality metrics up front that show that you're not hurting people. And then slowly over time, uh, it gets uh, adjusted. And then all of a sudden, um, how can you survive without it? Uh, and that's kind of where we are now. Uh, for, for all those leaders, enthusiasts who are coming in organizations, you know, not only institutions and in corporate world is the same, startups is the same. I think everywhere, uh, different people I talk with, you know, resistance to change is just within human nature, right? So. Any advice that got you where, you, like you were persistent, you said persistence and patience, but what made you successful at the end with those who were fully against it? Is there any advice that you can give leaders uh, to keep on trying and, and keep on believing what they are bringing? I would say if you're, if you're passionate um, and you have a, and your strong belief, um, you have to listen to people. So, I'm a big jazz fan. So Wynton Marsalis um, is a famous trumpet player whom you may know. Mm. Um, and he's really a philosopher as much as he is a trumpet player. And he talks about the difference between listening and hearing. Mm. And so um, I think it's important to not only listen, but to hear what people are saying. And you need to be able to incorporate that feedback and make sure people are, un are have an understanding that they're heard because um, if they are not heard, then they, then they feel like they're not part of the process. And if they feel like they're not part of the process, then, then they're in opposition. Um, so one of the strategies that I used when I was bringing this in was I rallied, I, I grouped together the loudest and biggest naysayers that I could find. Um, and I put them all in a room and said, I'm thinking about this ECMO thing. Tell me what you think. And I really wanted to know why you don't like it and what it is. And I really spent the whole meeting listening. I really didn't say much. And at the end, um, one of the surgeons said to me, well, Jason, aren't you gonna say anything? And I said, what you're, what you're all saying is very true. Your experience is very real. How many of you in this room have done ECMO in the last 10 years? And nobody had done it. And then I asked the question, is it possible that, that if we rolled out a system, taking into account all the things you just said carefully, that maybe we could do better than what we've done before, given what today is. And so then all of a sudden, my rollout group became my opposition group. And then mm -hmm. I had all, all the people that were against me were now helping me, even though they didn't necessarily know it, to build a better system so that when we rolled out, we were ready for their questions. What's the length of stay gonna be? How much is it gonna cost me? Is, is this the right thing for a patient to be done? When do you say no? What's the criteria? So all these questions led to the right guideline for implementation. And that way when it started, 
there was support and there was curiosity. What's this Gluck guy going to do? Not, is this Gluck guy crazy? And so <laughs> I think um, over time, we chipped away. Uh, I remember this one, I can tell you tons of stories, but I, you know, all these short questions, Najee, long answers, but um, <laughs> I remember this one stories. story. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there was a patient that was in the ICU, but one of my famous naysayers, um, and she had pneumonia. It was a very bad pneumonia and it wasn't getting better. And so he called me up and said, Jason, you wouldn't do it for this patient, right? And I said, yes, I would. Let's try it and see what happens. And so we, we put this patient on ECMO um, and we did a culture from the lungs and it came back as herpes zoster. And herpes zoster historically is a devastating pneumonia, 100% mortality. And so uh, we, I saw this come back and I put the person on acyclovir, which is the treatment for herpes. And uh, he, him and the ID doc came back the next day and said, let's stop the acyclovir. And I said, wait a minute, why? And they said, Jason, there's no way this is herpes pneumonia. And I said to him, why not? It's growing. And he said, because herpes pneumonia kills 100% of the time. And I said, you might as well be dead. He's on ECMO. Just try it. Mm -hmm. And so we tried it for seven days. And I guess good luck for me. The patient got better. And all of wow. a sudden, the patient came off ECMO. And now she went home. And so he says, I can't believe it. These patients don't, don't survive. And I said, what you're missing is we're rewriting what you know. Um, so, um, it was, it was Mark Twain. I'm from Hartford. So I have to quote Mark Twain, right? It ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so ECMO changed the game, right? It's game theory. It changed the game. And the same thing holds true rolling out a new idea. Sometimes you have to change the game. And so here I took the naysayers to help me figure out the next set of rules so that when we rolled out ECMO, it was really a different game. They just didn't know it really. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I impressive work. I want to go back to what, what you're living, and obviously, you know, not, I know you've been doing so much with COVID and your teams. Yeah, and I, but, but we recognize healthcare being challenged. You know, teams are being tired. It's tough for you. Like a year ago, I was discussing with with other uh, with other peers, obviously. You know, dealing with this disease, with the unknown, different guidelines coming in out. My main question is, how do you keep your people focused? How did you keep them uh, fighting through this disease to help uh, to help patients uh, today? And especially with 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 the amazing things that you've been doing, the energy that you have, you you went beyond the community that you serve in your institution. So, how do you do this with with your team on a daily basis? Yeah, and uh, COVID certainly puts that to the test. So um, we only tell good stories, right? So we only tell the ones that are, have did well. But like I said before, in COVID, for everyone that does well, there are three that didn't survive. And that's a hard reality, particularly for bedside providers, nurses, APRNs, PAs, uh, pharmacists, respiratory therapists, perfusionists, the whole, the whole gamut, doctors too. But um, I think it hits, hits really hard. Um, and so... Uh, there's this concept called critical incident stress debriefing, which is uh, a trauma, a trauma, um, psychological trauma system. And fortunately, um, I've been fortunate to learn from a lot of really smart uh, palliative care providers and psychiatrists and have partnered with them to really um, tell the stories of, of patients and their families and understand sometimes that even when someone doesn't survive, the caring, caringness that you provide to their, that patient and the family sees, uh, caring for the soul, if you will, of the patient in front of you, even if they don't survive, is, is, is really important and meaningful. Um, the way that we do that is by having regular meetings. I just had one last week with the, the nursing staff, and we actually um, brought in a survivor and his family and had them ask questions. How was it? You know, and the family was obviously elated. Um, that their their loved one survived, um, but uh, the patient got to tell the story from their perspective, which was very nice. Um, I'm also bringing in families of people that didn't survive, and having them share their stories and what their experience was. So there's a particular family of member of that that comes to mind. His wife died of COVID on ECMO. Um, she was 71. She fought hard, um, and she didn't survive. 
Um, but this husband who saw what the team did for his wife for, I think it was about three and a half weeks that she was on support, um, fighting to try and heal her and bring her back, caring for her as if it was their family member, was so touching to this man that to this day, even it's now about seven months since she, she died, pretty much once a, once a month, I get a letter or a phone call or something from him saying, thank you for what you and your team did. And sharing the stories of the quote unquote failures um, and realizing that failure in our mind as medical providers of someone not surviving is not really failure. Um, it's the success of caring for that patient, their soul and their, fa and their family that ring true in, in the loved one's eyes. And when they look back, they don't remember it the way that medical providers do. They don't remember it as somebody dying at the end of the stay. They remember how hard that patient fought and how hard the staff fought and how appreciative they were for it. And bringing in that different reality has helped us. That being said, it's still very hard, but that's the way that I'm trying to motivate my team. The last thing that I'm doing is highlighting the research aspect. So no patient dies alone. Every patient that we're taking care of is being studied. Everyone that we take care of is in an international registry. And we're trying hard to learn from each person, both success and death. And so um, whether a patient lives or dies, they are contributing to the next person that gets helped. And that's a meaningful and powerful message. Wow, it's so, so sobering um, to hear this and humbling, Jason. Uh, it, it's tough to find a transition, but I want us to move into a different section. Uh, where I would be giving you one word and I want to hear your first reaction. I'm, I'm hopeful it's going to be a, a story <laughs> with each one of those words again. So the first word is leadership. Yeah, um, I would say listening. Um, I think the key to leadership is, is listening. So I'm a believer in um, leading from the top down, the bottom up. And so you have to listen. You have to listen to what's going on around you um, and find a need and find what, what no one else is doing. Um, and then you have to listen to the people below you and you have to understand, in my opinion, where power is. And I'm, one of my sayings is powers in the word. Yes. Many people in, in, in medicine, especially think the powers in the word. No, by saying no to something that's you, that's you exhibiting power. When I think that's actually the easy way out. Power is in enabling people and making it so they can do what they need to do to make things better. So I try to look at leadership as being able to listen to what people want to do. And if, as long as I agree with it, finding a way for that to happen. So when someone says to me, you know, I have this idea to do this, like a nurse came in today and said, I want to try this. Um, I think it's a great idea. Let's try it. It may not work. Let's, let's make it happen. And so we're actually building it so that next week, a week after she asked, it's ready to go. And it may not work, um, but at least um, we're trying. And so I think power is in the word yes. I love it. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> so my seven-year-old <laughs> would say selling lemonade. Um, <laughs> because it comes from his book on entrepreneurship that I had him read for the kids book club. Um, so that it's lemonade comes to my mind with entrepreneurship. Um, but I think it's, it's actually very similar to leadership. It's, um, finding, finding that, that, that niche no one finds. So I remember playing soccer as a, as a kid, it was one of my favorite games or football as many non USians call it. Um, and so, uh, I, I had learned later in, in the game that I became a better player by running to the space, not running to the ball. And so um, if you can find a space that needs to be filled and fill it, you're an entrepreneur. Um, and I think that's the key. You talked about game theory and that was, I know you love games. So that, that was one of my, my third words. So um, having just come out of uh, competitive strategy, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, let, me, let me pull it up here for you. So I, I quote it correctly because I'll get it. I wrote it down because I like it so much. So um, in game theory, the, the parts comes to mind. So parts is players, added value, rules, tactics, and scope. 
And everything I've talked to you about so far today, I think falls into that, um, that parts theory. Whereas the, the key to yes is to change the game. Um, and so I think that uh, I can give you an example from today that I'm trying to fund uh, a project that I need for one of my um, mobile missions. Um, it's uh, not a lot of money, but it's enough where people raise their eyebrows. And of course the first answer was no, can't do it. We, we don't have any money to spend. Uh, and then um, by adding a little bit of context and I can show where the value is and show how if I bring in different players, we can diversify the, 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 the I can diversify the portfolio of who, who, who funds it. I can change the rules a little bit. I can take funds from a different place than they thought of. Um, and then, you know, maybe change the scope a little bit. This will do, this will bring in some more. What do you think about this? And all of a sudden the tactics change and all, well, well, now it's a new game. And then I actually just got an email a few minutes ago saying, well, let's talk more about this tomorrow. Maybe we could do something. So it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, way to play. <laughs> Great, and congrats then. Uh, what, what about spread love and organizations? Uh, important would be the word that I would say. Um, I think that what you're doing, Najee, is important. I think that um, too many times we are so focused on what we're doing, we forget the point. Whether you're a doctor or a plumber or a truck driver or a business person, at the end of the day, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to help people. Uh, our, everything that we're doing um, is trying to make life better for somebody by fixing their faucet, by driving them their food in the, for the day, by making the money in the stock market, whatever it is, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to spread love. And I think um, the message that you're sending through this podcast and the message that I think um, people need to hear, especially nowadays, is that at the end of the day, we're humanity and we have to help each other. And that's the only way we survive through anything. So hug your family, hug your kids. That's the key to living. And all the stuff that we do at work, all the money we make in the world, it's, it's pales in comparison to the love you get from your family and the love you get by spreading. So that would be my answer. Uh, any final word, Jason? I, I'd love to continue for hours with you. And I'm sure we're going to get a chance and, and redo another podcast with you. Um, but any final word of wisdom today for the leaders around healthcare? You mentioned also your kids, maybe also a word of wisdom for, for the kids uh, around the world who, who want to have an impact uh, in, in the future. Yeah, so there's kind of five sayings that I close most of my lectures with because I believe them um, very much. But one of them, one of them that I like is, is um, courage takes creativity and creativity takes courage. So I think that um, it's important to hold on to what you think is important and be creative in that space and make sure that when you, when, when you do things, if you think it through and you spend the time and, and you do your homework and you really put in the, the effort needed to, to develop what you're doing uh, in a courageous manner, uh, you can be creative even today. And I think that that creativity, that entrepreneurship, that leadership, that, that resonates, that love, um, that really allows for people to thrive. And I think if you thrive, the people around you will, will thrive, they'll be inspired, they'll want to do it also. And then all of a sudden you're building this momentum of success. And that um, is a, a wonderful thing to see. So don't be afraid to create and create courageously. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, for, for being with me today and for all that you're doing. I know you just jumped out of the hospital this, uh, this night and jumping here and inspiring all of us. Thanks for all you do for saving so many lives also on a daily basis. Najee, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to spread a little bit and I can't wait to see you in class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening today. Let's stay connected on spreadloveio.com, Apple, Google, or Spotify to hear more from great leaders in healthcare around the world. Most importantly, spread love in your organizations and spread the word around you to inspire others and amplify this movement our world so desperately needs.